Yeah. Okay, I'm recording. Wait. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to welcome you all to the Schiller Institute Sugarland event today. And uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to, to start with just so everyone will have a sense of the remarkable developments that's going on in our solar system on behalf of all mankind. We're going to start with that first because uh, that'll give you the context in how we're fighting for not just a better world, but to bring optimism to the idea of mankind unleashing great creative discoveries in the universe. So uh, what has now been found and has been developed is that the Chinese U-22 rover. Uh, Chinese have been the first nation to actually land a spacecraft on the far side of the moon. People, you know, because of all of the mayhem in the media right now may have forgotten about this, but it's uh, very significant because they've been there uh, and they're continuing to make major breakthroughs with their uh, Chinese rover. And the thing that was just reported on yesterday is that the Chinese have, uh, the U-22 rover has found a crater which has a, a substance that they're uh, saying is a gel-like substance of so sort of a green coloring. Now, the interesting thing about this is that what has now been discovered is because of the instrumentations that have been made by scientific breakthroughs that allow us to put spectrometers on the rover that gives us the access to uh, understanding what the makeup of this substance of this material that they found on Earth is, I mean, excuse me, on the far side of the moon. Uh, they found it in something called the Shorty Crater. Now, this, what has now been discovered through the infrared and visible spectro uh, spectrometer uh, instrument is that they're looking at the possibility of this being uh, glass, melt glass, uh, that has been a part of bombardment onto the moon by meteorites. Now, the last time that humanity made such a breakthrough and discovery was when we actually sent the last human beings to the moon of the Apollo astronauts. And the Apollo 17 astronauts being led by Harrison Schmidt and by uh, geologist Harrison Schmidt on the Apollo 17 mission in 1972, uh, and also Gene Cernan, were the last to make a discovery of a soil substance of orange-like coloring and this led to NASA making a discovery that this uh, orange soil that they found there was detected from meteorite bombardments, but also gave us insight into recognizing and knowing that this was due to uh, over three billion years of, of history. So, um, and let me make sure, yeah, yeah three point that this was 3.64 billion years ago that the, this soil had been formed. So that is quite remarkable. Now, why is this important in the context of the world we live in today and what's going on today? Well, and understanding how we can actually solve the problems of mankind by putting our focus on these very important discoveries for the common aims of mankind. Because yes, we just said this was an experiment and a discovery that the Chinese rover on the far side of the moon made, but it's not gonna be a discovery that's going to just impact only China. It's going to impact the, the understanding of how our solar system works for all of mankind. It's gonna impact uh, the United States. It's gonna impact all nations and all people, and so, as we think about that, the understanding of the fight that the Schiller Institute is waging right now to bring about an optimism of spreading creative discoveries in advance of this idea that mankind is limited and bounded by 
earth bounded by limited resources, by, bounded by anti-science, anti-technology, and that we should not allow for the unleashing of technology. And this is exactly what uh, Helga LaRouche in her recent webcast that she gave, which was titled, The Financial Crash is Looming Like a Big Tsunami, really warned about and situated the context of this financial crash in from the standpoint that, that the people who are pushing this financial oligarchy's attempt to move for an all-out, what you would call um, the financial oligarchy that is now moving for a total regime change policy in the, in the financial system, uh, which was very much made clear by the attempts that were stated and the, that were stated just recently from a meeting that was held by leaders of the Bank of England, leaders of the Federal Reserve, um, also led by a guy by the name of Carney, also by uh, the Bank of, uh, Bank of England leader. But what they made clear is that we have to stop all scientific progress by putting our resources again into bailing out this financial system with quantitative easing, with hyperinflationary funding, and with the, tar the same type of system, but even worse than what, what took place in 2007-2008. And what they made clear is that the key to this is to saving this bankrupt financial system and is to actually organize bailing out more quantita quantitative easing, bailing out the, the, the bankrupt dollar by saying that we're going to actually put more funding into what's called green projects, the green new deal, green bailout, not into science. And so this is what we have really looked at as you're now seeing that the intention of the financial oligarchy to go for total regime change uh, population reduction policies has been made very clear as in the last few weeks the focus has now been on the fact that right as we speak the green apparatus, which we're now exposing as total eco-fascism, has said that what they've done is they've allowed for um, their using of the young people, like this girl Greta Thunberg, uh, to, uh, who has been pumped up by the green movement as the future of our youth, to expose that the role of our young people, the role of our society right now is to stop scientific progress, is to stop the development of uh, industry to, and she has now been swept into the United States, should we say, through the winds on a sailboat and a yacht. A yacht. Through a few billionaires. <laughs> through a crooks. few billionaires and crooks, exactly, <laughs> who, who she just arrived at in, she just recently arrived in New York, where the head of the UN General Assembly, Gutierrez, is promoting her. She's now out doing uh, promotions in front of the UN General Assembly in New York about uh, promoting the green eco-fascism, green agenda, uh, that human beings need to stop breathing, we need to stop eating meat, we need to stop uh, flying in airplanes and all of these things and and pushing this against the idea that right now the only thing that these guys have going for them is to kill people by saying that we got to put more funding into these in, into these green projects than we do into real uh, physical economic development. And that's why we're having this discussion today, because if you think about it, 
you you have what Helga Zeppler-Rusch has made clear that the Schiller Institute is absolutely essential to bringing about peace, bringing about economic progress in the world right now. And we're doing this by identifying a new objective for mankind. And that objective has recently been very much made clear by the efforts of Mrs. LaRouche and her late husband, Lyndon LaRouche, who have laid out the foundation for a true economic recovery program. And that foundation starts with the idea that there can be, one, no limits to growth. Two, that the promoters of the environmentalist movement of the green radical, uh, what we're calling themselves eco-fascism, and also the deep green resistance, are making clear that as we were, as we understood by the intentions of this operation going all the way back to the 1970s, that one thing that we got them on, absolutely, is the fact that they said that their, their pushing of the idea, this is the limits to growth operations uh, organized by people like uh, Forrester and Dennis Meadows. And we were just talking about this in discussions today. Well, one thing is that this is not just the Malthusian operation that has said that, um, has said that there's limited resources and everything is winding down into attrition and after a while you're going to have too many people that are going to use up the resources but what they make clear is that in their modeling similar to the fake modeling that we have right now with the ideas of uh, carbon dioxide and the increases in carbon dioxide and the fake modeling that's showing that our you know, human beings are destroying the lung of the earth and the Amazon and so forth. But the, the fake modeling then, which is absolutely the case now, is that they say they don't account for scientific and technological progress, for scientific revolution. That's interesting to think about. Because if you're going to make this promotion or this assertion that everything is limited resources winding down, then, and you say that there's nothing you can do about it, but then say that you reject the idea of technological progress, that's where you can call them out for their lies. So with that, we take the example of this what the Schiller Institute has been doing to define that increase in man's creative discovery through making new breakthroughs in scientific and technological progress that's actually going to increase our resources on the planet, that's going to allow us to make new breakthroughs, such as in the development of new fusion uh, technologies, thermonuclear fusion technologies, mining of resources on the moon, and also through putting our funding through a credit mechanism of the cooperation of the four leading powers of the world. This is very important through the development as the great economist and statesman Lyndon LaRouche has called for that we have to actually organize for a top-down new uh, system uh, what we call the, the New Bretton Woods system, a new, new financial system that's going to actually put credit into real economy, into the physical economy, into new scientific and technological breakthroughs. And the key to that is that you have to have a four powers cooperation. And you, what we just had recently, very in, I just learned about is the uh, founder of Schiller Institute founder Helga LaRouche, along with other members of the uh, other members of the Schiller Institute, in cooperation with an organization called the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences uh, of West Asia and Africa Center, 
had a conference just two days ago in Berlin. And this conference was scheduled on the role of the Belt and Road Initiative, which has now been taken up, led by China, taken up by many nations, and is actually impacting economic growth throughout Africa, throughout many parts of the world, uh, has actually this, this program was on the idea, the theme of the Belt and Road Initiative in Peace in West Asia and Africa. So the question of how we're going to end these endless wars, how we're going to end this speculative bailout system, it, and how we're going to actually bring about the common aims of mankind is that we're not just talking about the US, Russia, China, India, the four leading powers of the world getting along here on Earth and coming to uh, contractual agreements, if you will, or treaty agreements and so forth. We're talking about that these nations have to come together in the common names of mankind in leading humanity to the breakthrough or into the breakthroughs that are needed to end poverty, to bring about the needed solutions to the planet, to end these endless wars, and to bankrupt completely the city of London, Wall Street, and the financial oligarchy that says that their system is more important than human life. And we would rather eliminate people, stop economic progress, industrial progress and growth, and, and scientific breakthroughs than to allow for uh, having our system destroyed. And so I just wanted to end with something that Helga had to say in the context of uh, her remarks in this, web, in this webcast that she gave, because the title of, of her final remarks in the webcast were Return to science, Real Science and Classical Art. And she stated that going after the common interests, the common aims of mankind, the common good of nations is much better, is a much better approach. And we will fight to have a return to scientific ideas and of, of the physical universe, of natural science, of great classical art. Basically, the ideas of Lyndon LaRouche, which I can only encourage people to study. If you go to our archives, you will find enormous qualities, quantities of articles by LaRouche. Contained in those articles are beautiful, profound conceptions which have developed by any, by anybody to the present time. And therefore, again, I ask you to join the fight for the exoneration of LaRouche and join the efforts in time to get Europe and the nations of the United States to cooperate in with, the, with Russia and with China in a new paradigm. She says, because if we don't, do not change the presently loony geopolitical confrontation, the world can actually end up in a catastrophe. The crisis points are many seemingly minor incidents under these conditions can easily trigger larger conflicts. So we have to have a new cooperation between the United States, Russia, China, and India, and we have to give up the European uh, European nations, for they too can be brought back to reason. So again, as we think about what is not being told to you on the media, the idea that the Chinese have just made a breakthrough for all of humanity, similar to what the United States did in 1972, but the key thing is that we should be making these breakthroughs together. And so as we now look at the direction that India is going to, in the next few days, be landing a rover on the moon, the Chinese are continuing. The United States, under the direction of President Trump, has now announced that we're going back to the moon with the first woman and the next man, and we're going to be landing in a very important crater 
that's called the Shackleton Crater, right? That's going to potentially unfold new breakthroughs never been made before. But the key to this is we can't just be up on the moon with the same conflicts that we have here. Well, I'm going to have a border over here and the Chinese are going to you know, have their little space on the moon and then the Russians will have their space and the Indians will have their space in the U.S. And then all of, we're going to be having a war in space about who's making these types of discoveries. It's never going to work. So that's the point is um, just thinking about that, that breakthrough the question is, what is going to be the relationship of mankind? How are we going to overcome these conflicts? And how can we use this potential for uh, unifying or meeting the common names of mankind by doing away with this anti-growth, anti-human agenda and say that we're going for a new paradigm. As said, we're going for a new direction. So we'll have more on that, but just wanted to kind of give you guys a sense of what's going on that's not in the news media. <laughs> Keisha, this, uh, <clears throat> this uh, green stuff you found on the moon, uh, I assume it's not cheap. I didn't find it, the Chinese did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's not cheese. It's not green cheese. <laughs> no, I, I saw a I saw a, a video once a few years ago uh, called uh, Tutankhamun's Comet's Fireball," and it talks about how a, a comet or a meteor hit the desert in the Sahara, and it, it turned the depth the, the the sand into green glass. Mm -hmm. A certain unique color of green <laughs> in the glass, mm -hmm. um, and that these droplets went, you know, they splashed everywhere, and uh, then many, many, many years later, the jewel maker for the Egyptian guy, uh, Pharaoh, um, put it in a, a brooch, you know, that the guy wore. He made a, a scarab beetle uh, jewelry out of it. And I was, uh, and then they yeah, found, they discovered that, because they're just like, well, what is this, you know, now, anthropologists, you know, centuries of millennia later were like, well, what is this weird thing? Because it's not the typical, it's not jade, it's something else, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's how they figured out that it was actually created by an impact crater rather than, you know, mined or whatever as an ore. Hmm. So, I mean, is, is that kind of like, that's kind of what we're talking about, is that you have an impact crater that would have oh, yeah. taken, taken like, the silicone or whatever that's in the lunar soil and and turn it into glass from from like a high high temperature reaction is that kind of what they're talking about or do you have more that you can say? They, uh, not at the moment. I mean, I know they are still looking at it right now um, in terms of what the substance is actually made of, um, and then they also found something similar in the Von, Car Von Karman <coughs> crater. Okay. You just mentioned it had something to do with like the heavy bombardment period. And, uh, yeah, but I haven't, they haven't said much haven't more, said about it. more about mm -hmm. it. Okay. So th this is Brian. I'm uh, Brian Lance. Picking up where Keisha left off. We're we have a division of labor here on Labor Day, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to be presenting uh, on um, on uh, a Space Civilian Conservation Corps, Space CCC, um, and what that would look like, um, and of course why it's needed. Uh, and it is appropriate that we're having this meeting here on 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 Labor Day weekend um, uh, because this is. Keisha was speaking directly to this, but the issue of labor, not simply labor in terms of blood and sweat, that obviously uh, occurs, um, but labor in the sense of man changing nature for the future of mankind. Uh, man making physical changes on nature for man. Um, this goes to the heart of uh, physical economy, of, of thinking 
in a positive way, an affirmative way about ourselves and the universe. Um, a, a problem, a, a profound problem we have in the country today, uh, and, and, and you see it that it's in Europe as well, deeply now kind of entrenched. Uh, uh, Greta Thunberg just simply reflects this, is a, a nihilism that's born of a false idea that that we are, we as mankind are somehow just kind of attached to sitting on top of uh, the earth uh, and, um, and uh, uh, simply uh, looting it. Um, uh, and uh, if we would only kind of disappear, nature would be, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, you know, the, these animals that, that we see on cartoons and so forth would populate the world and they would all have fun and, and have games and so on. You know, Mickey Mouse and Captain Kangaroo, I don't know what, uh, you know, completely, you know, um, it's really a, a, a strange worldview when you th step back and, and look at it. Um, not just because of, it's absurd, but, but, but more for what it totally misses, that, that we are part of creation. We were created um, in the process, the creation, continuing creation of the universe itself. Uh, you can go back and, and Plato and Socrates were aware of this. This is not, you know, the roots of this concept go back. This is uh, an outgrowth of this is in the Christian concepts. In the Old Testament, you know, the shared Old Testament of, of Judaism, Christianity, and, and Islam, you know, that... Uh, that our, uh, the concept of being fruitful, multiplying, filling the earth, and subduing it, this idea that we have a positive role to play in the further development of our earth and the universe, uh, affirms uh, what otherwise should already be understood, that we're here, and we're here, and, and we have a purpose in being here. Um, so when we speak of labor, and we think of labor, we're thinking of it, and should be thinking about it in that framework. And that's how Lyndon LaRouche has framed it in terms of, uh, of uh, physical economy. Uh, and uh, his books are, are available, uh, and, um, and uh, papers, and so forth. And uh, these are incredibly influential now, whether it's in China, or India, or in Europe, uh, or here. Uh, LaRouche's eight presidential campaigns, which really were one presidential campaign, kept in the forefront of, of the American people the ideas of Alexander Hamilton, of the American um, system, of Abraham Lincoln, of Roosevelt, that all of these uh, unique individuals each promoted uh, the concept of man as a, a positive force and being in the world. Um, so. Having said that, we go to, uh, to Project Artemis. We start with President Trump's announcement uh, in April. Um, do we have the slides up? Yeah. Okay. Um, turn the light up. Oh, okay. Um, we go to Project Artemis. I'm not going to uh, spend much time. I'm just framing this question of labor. If we uh, look at Project Artemis, um, and um, what are the requirements? Project Artemis, announced in April by President Trump, says we're going to put a man and woman on the moon within five years, by 2024. Uh, and we're going to begin uh, a uh, permanent sustained presence, uh, this term being used as sustained presence on the moon, uh, by 2028. Uh, Implicit there is that we're going to go on to colonize it, and as Trump is saying, and we're going on to the moon and uh, to Mars and beyond. Um, this is Project Artemis. This is NASA's program. This is not somebody's uh, pipe dream. This is a, the policy of the United States right now, um, and, and this is a schematic of that uh, of that process from Artemis One on the left hand side, Artemis Two, uh, and Artemis Three, the crewed mission to Gateway and then to the lunar surface, the Gateway being um, the small space station, if you will, in orbit around the moon, which has to still be put up there in the course of this next five years. Uh, and to do this, we're looking at, uh, here's the uh, complete manifest 
that uh, NASA has circulated uh, of the, the uh, launches, 37 uh, launches, which will be required to complete this stage of, of the effort for moon colonization and beyond. 37 launches in a period of five years. That's, that's a serious uh, a venture. Uh, and we're going to need, as Jim Bridenstine has emphasized, the director of NASA, uh, and Trump himself, we need international cooperation. We, ha we have it already uh, on features of the, um, of the, uh, of the mission. Um, the Orion is, uh, we have the help of the European Space Agency uh, in the building of the Orion. Uh, which is being launched on the space launch system, the rocket itself. Um, but we're going to need a lot more. We're going to need the cooperation of China and other nations. Now this takes us, as the next slide, I was starting to show it already, um, takes, has to, we have to frame this from the standpoint of where we are right now, from the standpoint where we are but where we've got to go. The, the Moon-Mars colonization mission is, re, is, is a revival of Kennedy's perspective. The revival of the Franklin Roosevelt, the Abraham Lincoln, the John Quincy Adams perspective. We're going out and beyond. We're, we're challenging ourselves. We're, cha we're challenging our role, uh, uh, our, our mastery, our knowledge, and to extend it. Um, but we have to look now at where we are. This is uh, the uh, famous triple curve that, uh, that Lyndon LaRouche first presented at a conference in the Vatican. Uh, in Rome in the 1990s um, uh, and projecting forward uh, now um, and you see that there's three curves in here uh, that you're looking at a blue curve which is what I'm going to focus on that's the physical economic inputs and outputs that is the actual goods produced that go in then back into the economy uh, and then uh, into the productive process, the employment of people, the education of people, and so forth, and then the outputs, the the next uh, the next phase in the cycle, the outputs, uh, and that process is a continued, extended, nonlinear um, uh, process of development. Well, that process has been uh, 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 aborted, shall we say? That downward curve is the collapse of the United States in terms of physical economic inputs and outputs. This is the collapse of manufacturing, the rust bucket, uh, and otherwise what we see in the, in the floods in the Missouri and Ohio rivers, for example, Mississippi, um, that could have been prevented long ago. The criminal negligence, as, as Keisha was referencing it. Um, uh, okay, now, on the other hand, we've got these other curves. Uh, the, uh, You've got the red curve, financial aggregates. That's Wall Street and the city of London. That's the financial paper, which is usurious, right? Uh, the old example we used to use is of, of slum dwellings in New York City. You know, there was no reason to tear down those slum dwellings uh, from the standpoint of Wall Street uh, because uh, as long as you could keep upping the rent on the people there because there was nowhere else to live, Right? The value of that property kept going up. Its market value kept going up. Um, so there was no need to maintain those, tenant, uh, those, those slum dwellings. Uh, uh, this was part of the economic um, growth, cancerous growth of the economy. Um, and it's the stock market today. Uh, then you see the monetary aggregates. This is the necessity of expanding the money supply. This is what uh, uh, Powell at Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, a week ago was, was presenting, that we're now going to nail interest rates basically down to anchor it at, at zero interest rates. Europe's already at below zero interest rates. They're printing money like crazy, uh, and they're going to do more. And it's not sufficient at this point. This is the point of, of this green agenda is under conditions of facing a financial collapse like we see up there of the red line of the financial aggregates facing that that we're now at a, a tipping point um, there's a need to continue to push out uh, financials into the market to protect asset values uh, for them not your asset values that's going towards zero uh, in terms of the blue line 
uh, but their asset values is measured in terms of monetary, uh, in monetary terms, <coughs> in terms of their holdings of financial values on paper. Um, uh, the green agenda is going to increase those values by, by creating tremendous shortages, uh, and then they'll control what's left uh, to distribute at their prices. Um, so that gives, I hope, a sense. So we have to reverse that blue curve. A recovery starts with the first part of LaRouche's four laws, a Glass-Steagall reenactment, financial reorganization of the banking system, a writing off of these, moment, these financial aggregates, writing down to real uh, values, that is, the values that these goods actually represent to man's future, future production and growth. Um, we're going, uh, that's the first step. And then comes, uh, or simultaneous, the creation of a national bank or a national infrastructure bank to then provide credits. The banks don't have money to lend, if you haven't noticed that. They're not lending into the industry. They're not lending into farms. Uh, farms are going bankrupt. Manufacturers is, is shrinking again after a slight uptick um, under the Trump administration. It's already now contracting again. So to, to, uh, to the, the banks, under conditions of reorganization and writing off of their financial aggregates, they're not going to be able to lend even what they're lending now. So federal credits are the great key. But also federal, credit, federal credits give us the ability to direct our lending into the productive areas of the economy. Uh, and this is what part of what we have to address. This is the flooding on the Missouri River. Uh, now, 2019, this is what's occurred. And you hardly hear about it in the press. It's like a small little article in the corner or maybe a, a, you know, a five second blurb on a, on a TV news show. Um, and if you remember, this is Harvey. Uh, Hurricane Harvey two years ago, two years ago now, right now, um, before and after shots, you know, uh, the same scene, more, more or less the same scene. Um, uh, and, you know, the devastation of that, human and otherwise, the loss of resources, all because we had not built the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the infrastructure that was uh, required uh, to have prevented this kind of flooding. Uh, which was known uh, and designed for, uh, but never built. Uh, like, likewise with the Missouri and Mississippi and Ohio rivers. This is an example of one of the old, oldest in the world functioning uh, 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 trams, you could say, uh, transit uh, uh, trains, and it's in New York City. This is the state of New York City transit. Uh, uh, the, the, the tunnels under the Hudson River are going to have to be closed within 20 years. Uh, th that's already been announced. They're going to have to be closed within 20 years because there's no way that they can be maintained uh, now. They'll, 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 they'll collapse. They're, probably, they're well beyond. They're operating at well over capacity now. But in, within 20 years, just the physical structures themselves are going to be, uh, uns uh, you know, are, are going to be on uh, salvaging. Um, so we're going to, we had, so it's much more than just replacing old trains with new trains. We've got to have an entirely new transportation system, transportation grid for New York City. And you can think of other cities that need them as well. Um, um, and then this is, uh, this is Greta Thunberg and some of her friends, including mass friends in the forest in Germany. This is another problem we've got to solve, uh, the, you know, this, this nihilism uh, as we're addressing it. Um, uh, and get people off, off their, uh, their so-called smartphones that are dumbing everybody down. Um, uh, and unemployment, I mean, this is, this is, this is the, really goes to the potential, both of these pictures in different ways, the potential of our youth uh, to be productive, uh, to create a future, uh, is the task before us. Um, and underemployment, as well as employment, is a, is a major feature of, of this situation. Now, we faced this problem before. These are hobos. There is, there is a, a quarter of a million young men uh, on uh, hobos uh, in, in the 1930s, young men. Uh, lots of older men, too, but a quarter of a million, it's estimated, in terms of young men. 
hobos in the 1930s. Um, and this was the context in which Franklin Roosevelt announced that uh, the Co Civilian Conservation Corps in 1933, almost immediately after he was sworn in as president, they initiated the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps. And it was done through the, uh, it was done through four departments, uh, interior, agriculture, war, um, and I'm, think, I'm, I'm forgetting one right now. Uh, we'll come back to it. Uh, but four departments, agriculture. Um, those four departments ran, ran the program. Our, uh, agriculture and interior came up with the projects, like that. You know, the projects were known. Um, uh, uh, the uh, labor department came up with the workforce. Uh, they began enrolling, opening enrollments. You had to already be on the equivalent of food stamps and family assistance. That was all, at that point, it was all basically run at the state level. But you had, it was called on the dole. People were on the dole because there were no jobs. You know, there was the, uh, the, the blinding um, uh, storms in, in, uh, in Oklahoma and so forth, the, the collapse of agriculture, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, so the quartermaster, Quartermaster Corps of the U.S. Army mobilized the logistics and deployed the logistics across the entire country to these projects, right? As as they were being named, right? Um, uh, the the equipment, uh, the uh, temporary uh, tent quarters, uh, the food, uh, kitchens, all of this was supplied virtually overnight because the Army does these kind of things. Think of how we could utilize. Uh, in a better way, portions of our military that are now, you know, still stuck over the remnants of these endless wars. Um, um, and, from barrack, and from these tents, they moved them into barracks uh, before the first winter, uh, and everywhere except for the south. Um, but this was done very, you know, very rapidly. These, these camps were about 200 people on average. Um, and then in the camps, you had uh, the limbs, local experienced men that were hired, eight to a camp, the top masonry, carpentry, and, and other uh, useful skills. Uh, by 1937, which it was only in 37 they actually formalized this whole structure. This thing was done on an ad hoc basis. It was initially started with a, on the idea of being a six months program, and then it was expanded. It was so popular. I mean, uh, the average individual joining, joining the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps uh, gained 11 pounds in the first three months in the program. 11 pounds. I mean, they, it speaks for itself. Um, so, uh, uh, so, uh, so this was the process that was underway. Um, the the program, I'm not sure. If, uh, yeah, it, it involved uh, education. Teachers were brought in in 1937. That was what I was starting to say. Uh, teachers were brought in at least one per camp. Uh, 40,000 young men uh, were taught to read and write. Uh, other programs as well, uh, in terms of training, radio work, all kinds of areas were developed. I mean, you got to stay, you know, you're working on large projects in the forest, you got to be in touch with other people, for among other reasons, to protect against forest fire. But you also have to be uh, regulating for equipment and supplies and so on and so forth. So th these are not in inconsequential. Uh, this was happened to have been before the age of smartphones. Wow. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Wi-Fi, before okay. Wi-Fi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so um, uh, and these were the larger projects simultaneously that were being built by the Works Progress Administration, Harry Hopkins program, right? Um, the Four Corners project and so forth, uh, the additional financing of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, uh, the, the Tennessee Valley Authority, in particular, was the work of the, of the WPA. Um, so those are some of the projects. But these, uh, these uh, projects, these, these camps, um, the, the, the number on, uh, reached 300,000. That was the average that were in these camps, about 2,600 camps across the country, some of them smaller, some of them larger. Um, uh, 2,600 camps. Every state wanted them. Whether they were Republicans or Democrats, they wanted them. Uh, they were popular. Uh, the, the paychecks, uh, $30 uh, a month. Uh, 22 to $25 of that paycheck was sent home. 
Uh, it provided support uh, to families, needed, needy families, uh, but also, you know, word of the works, the good works were coming through. Um, in 37, um, you had the flooding of the Ohio and, and uh, Mississippi rivers in the, in, the, in the north. The CCC was there, uh, sent in there. Uh, uh, likewise, in, in New, New York, uh, 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 flooding in, in, in that region, in the, in the state, that same year. The next, day, uh, next year was the uh, New England hurricane uh, and the CCC was sent in there, along with WPA and other forces. But the point was, this is part of what was being done. But 300,000 men on average in these camps, the program was uh, basically worked out to a year and a half uh, in six month segments, but basically a year and a half became the, the, the uh, process. Um, and, uh, uh, and so in the total period of the project from 1933 to 1942, uh, approximately um, three million uh, Americans, young men, went through the program, uh, uh, averaging roughly around a year and a half apiece. And that was five percent of the uh, young men in the country in that time frame. Five percent went through the Civilian Conservation Corps. And when World War II mobilization began with the draft and so on, uh, the young men who, who uh, joined the military uh, to fight fascism uh, in World War II, uh, they were seen as, as, as uh, the first to go to. They were made uh, corporals and sergeants, basically upon being sworn in and, and, and doing boot camp, uh, because they were known to already know uh, from the work of these camps and how these camps, each of them were organized from the top down, militarily and so forth, uh, how to operate in units. Uh, usually 50-man units in the case of the CCC. Um, so that's a little bit, bit of the background. Now, look, other countries, right? This is China. This is just a small portion of the, of, of the railroad station. I believe this is Shanghai. Um, these are high-speed rail trains. Uh, they they crisscross the entire country, as many of, of you know. Um, uh, this is the kind of thing. This is China's... Uh, 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 Long March. Yeah. <coughs> China's Long March are one of them. Now they have several, you know, iterations, right? Long March uh, rockets. Um, uh, hardly a top secret. You can see this is a very public matter in China these days. Um, China's doing these things. Now think of where China was less than two generations ago, um, and, uh, and, and it's remarkable. So the idea of what we can do today in the context of uh, a Moon Mars colonization mission, of the scope that it actually has to be to work, and the resources that have to be deployed to make it work, and the payoff of the projects themselves as they're put to work, um, uh, we can do the same and better uh, in the United States. Um, Africa, right? Railroads are now, modern railroads are now being built in Africa, primarily by China. But India and Japan is coming in as well with other infrastructure projects. Where are we? Um, this is the highway and, and, and rail projects for Africa. You know, where are we with projects? Um, uh, this is what LaRue spelled out in his textbook. So you wish to learn all about economics, the principles of how you build economies, uh, whether China, India, or the United States. Um, and so today, we can create a modern workforce. Uh, young men and women can be recruited to build that workforce. Uh, we can build a new generation of scientists and skilled uh, engineers, machinists, and others. This can be done here as it is elsewhere. And, and just to come back to it quickly, this is Texas, since we're here in Texas. This is a topological map of, of the state uh, from the top there all the way down to the deepest green, that's where all the rivers go. They all drain out into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and uh, they drain out, and that's where the flooding was. Now, there was dams planned on all of these rivers. There's a few, but there was more planned on all of these rivers that were never built by the various flood control districts, never funded at the state level, or they were on the books to be funded, but the funding never, you know, uh, 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 came into being. 
Um, this is why we have problems. But this is what can be solved with the CCC, with a modern space age CCC, working alongside contractors, building these projects, the same for the Missouri, for the, for the upper Mississippi that have never had a real basin projects as we have on the lower Mississippi. Um, likewise with the infrastructure of New York City. And likewise with uh, these kinds of surge protection uh, systems that need to be built uh, as along the coast of, of Texas, um, which, uh, you know, right now only exists in Denmark. Um, so, um, and a smaller scale version in, in, in New Orleans. So again, uh, uh, flooding here, um, this uh, in, uh, on a, a smaller uh, river in Ohio, but again, some of the flooding that's occurred this, this year. Um, and this is what a modern high speed rail transportation system would look. This was put together by Dr. Cooper, Hal Cooper, and Richard Freeman uh, in the 1990s. Uh, two stages, uh, the blue is high speed rail, the red is maglev, a two, uh, a two step process to begin filling in the country and then building from there. Uh, this is what we could be doing. We could have already been doing this. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the drawings on the Bering Strait tunnel to connect the U.S. to the world, the world land bridge across the Bering Straits in Alaska to connect uh, the U.S. and Canada and Mexico, all the Americas, uh, to Eurasia. That's where we could be going. That's where we can be going. Uh, uh, here was an earlier plan by the High Speed Rail uh, uh, Association that you see there. Uh, and, uh, and they believe that they would have this whole system. They would have the orange systems built by 2020. Uh, the green would have been built by 2015. Of course, none of this occurred. Um, but uh, uh, this is, you can go, you can find this website. It, it's still up, um, but uh, it's never been done. But it can be done, and, and, but it will only be done in the context of a, a Roosevelt-style New Deal program uh, mobilizing our uh, workforce, including young people, a new workforce. Now here is just taking you to here to HCC to the Advanced Manufacturing Center of Excellence um, and uh, their facilities. Uh, and I'm just showing you, this is, these are uh, CNC machine tool, probably th three uh, axis uh, machine tools, uh, a whole series of them, but you know, currently, right now at this moment, the, the uh, the, the department uh, that trains in, in, uh, in, in, uh, trains machinists at HCC Stafford is operating at approximately 25% of capacity of what they could train. The door is open. They're available. Um, and it's not like they're just sitting there. As we know, they came to an event by the Schiller Institute in Bayland. Uh, they go to uh, high schools. They go to uh, uh, organizations to make presentations. They go to summer camps down to the grade school level uh, to, with the idea of uh, recruiting uh, young men and women into uh, STEM programs and specifically, obviously, into the programs that they're offering there at HCC. But, you know, the idea is, oh, well, this is dirty work. Uh, machinists, uh, you know, guys working in a shed, you know, uh, it's hotter than hell, it's uh, lousy, and uh, who would want to do it? It's dirty work. Um, uh, this is, you know, what the teachers told me. Uh, so, but this is what it's like. This is what, a, a, what a, a machine shop looks like today, a modern machine shop, um, uh, more or less like this. Um, and it's, increased, it's incredibly demanding in terms of skills. Um, uh, you need at least pre -calc up to the pre-calculus level. Calculus is encourage. Uh, you study physics, you study chemistry. You, you have to know metals. You have to know, know material science. Um, uh, you don't just start operating a, a CNC machine tool, you know, which is programmed, right? Uh, you've got to work with the manual, manual machine tools to begin with to know what materials feel like, how they respond to, to cutting to pressure and so forth, because as you know, as I said, they speak to you. The materials, the machine speaks back to you. You have to be able to hear, right? If you're not going to destroy materials, 
cause accidents, etc. So you have to learn these things also. So it's very hands-on as well. And then you're getting up to computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacturing, CAD CAM. All of this is what goes into graduating a two-year student out of uh, HCC in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, as a machinist, a, a trained machinist with a degree. Um, that's, uh, that's a, um, a $40,000 a year job. Yet they've got 25% enrollment. What are, we, what are we dealing with here? Well, we're dealing with, uh, you know, of course, you know, like the, the, the teacher, the machinist teacher told me, you know, you're dealing with a certain image of what being a machinist, being a worker, it involves. Uh, these things have changed. Um, uh, but it's also we're dealing with other features of the, uh, of the process. We're dealing with the general ennui, the, the uh, nihilism in terms of uh, the lack of a sense of a future. This is where the Moon Mars mission comes in. Not just what Trump has proposed so far, but the broader mission that we're posing in terms of the full Moon Mars colonization program, which is a 50-year program that LaRouche laid out in the 90s. That's what has to be taken up. You know, reshaped, so forth and so on. These things get worked over. But the point is you've got to have that huge, large perspective. With that kind of perspective, you can, you can fire the imaginations of youth. That this is, this is a different future than this kind of cultural prison that they've been in, you know, uh, of uh, social media and, uh, and uh, green ideology that they've had, you know, basically rammed down their throats, you know, since they were, before they were in the first grade. Um, uh, the kind of future that they have uh, for a, a young, a uh, blue-collar kid coming out of high school is in this kind of process of high-tech machine tool work, machine tool design, even more developed tool and die, um, all kinds of other areas, uh, technical degrees. There's two years degrees in aerospace engineering, in aerospace engineering tech, a two-year degree. Um, uh, mechanical engineering tech, two-year degree. Um, but where, where would you go to work with those de degrees right now? You know, you might go to defense, you might build bombs, you know, something like that. Uh, but there's, all, there's only a limited number of those positions, and you not, may not live in the part of the country where those jobs even exist. Um, uh, what has been, this, what has been the, the context that we've been living in? Think about it. Um, the rust bucket. The entire manufacturing sector of the United States, the, the heartland of it, you know, shut down and became the rust bucket. Um, NASA, NASA is down to 70,000 workers, including private contractors, 17,000 working for NASA, 60,000 uh, private contractors working through their companies for NASA, uh, you know, Lockheed, Boeing, and so on and so forth. Uh, it was 450,000 at the peak in the mid-60s. Um, that's the size we've got to grow NASA to as well. National credit, we can create the mechanism, and then by utilizing the creativity of our population, we can pay those credits back, so to speak. We can more than retire uh, any uh, debt created uh, by the increased output and productivity that we unleash. Uh, some more pictures here. That, uh, Fab Labs, this is an interesting, well, this is part of the actual machine tool. This is the manual machine tool section of the, of the, uh, of the uh, 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 innovation center. Um, this is a, a, a gentleman, the supervisor of the fabrication laboratory there at uh, HCC Stafford. Uh, and that is more of the equipment there that's available, All hand tools, uh, CNC, additive manufacturing tools. Um, and look, there's a, look right now, hybrid machine tools are coming online. They're online. They're being purchased now into aerospace uh, that combine uh, uh, um, additive manufacturing with, uh, what's the term for it? Re re um, sub well, anyway, subtracting manufacturing. <laughs> machine tools, you know, cutting, mill milling, and all the rest, you know. It, it could, these machine tools combine both into a single machine that can do it all. 
They can take a single piece of metal and both, you know, cut and turn and so forth. And on the other hand, it can also do additive uh, manufacturing processes to the same mm -hmm. piece. And then the piece can be polished and so forth. I mean, these are incredible tools that are being developed, so-called hybrid machine tools. Uh, but here in, in these fab labs, there's now hundreds and hundreds of these fab labs across the United States. Uh, schools, community centers, even libraries. The downtown central library here in Houston is getting a fab lab. Um, yeah, <laughs> people can come into these fab labs with you know with their schematics, their designs, uh, with a prototype, um, and and these guys will work with you uh, to turn those things into reality. Um, you know, some of it's kind of like you know an occupation with gizmos and and oh we're going to turn everybody into a you know a Thomas Edison. Uh, they're going to go in there and they're going to you know produce some uh, gadget. But uh, so, so there's a you know, kind of tinkerer's kind of aspect to this, like the basement tinker. But also, at the same time, of course, basement tinkers were people that did create things, uh, did make, if not fundamental scientific discoveries, they did make real applications, discoveries in terms of applications of scientific yeah, discoveries. Yeah, I said, I said tinkered in his mind. Yes. Uh, uh, and, and in dialogue with others, yes, but it, yes. So, so, so th that's also a feature of these fab labs. These are people where people interact and discuss, and oh, this is my project. I, I'm trying to solve this problem. What do you have? Uh, what is a, it's a, 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 these exist in Europe as well, some in Asia. The point is that these fab labs and, and the whole makers movement uh, is about making things with your hands and producing things. So there's a desire out there among people, young and otherwise, but particularly young people, to build, to make. And this is what we can tap into, and we got a, uh, we've, got, we've had a taste of that with our events around the country, uh, around the 50th anniversary of Apollo. Uh, we can tap that and, and or, uh, build our own organizing efforts for the moon Mars colonization, but also, at the same time, this is a, you know, this is a witness to uh, the potential that does exist out there. Look, we've got two million unemployed young people in this country. You know, between the ages of 17 and 25 or so. Uh, two million plus. That's official Bureau of Labor Statistics figures. So the figures are probably significantly more than that. We've got 800,000 young men and women in jails and prisons in the United States. At any one time, they're cycling through, right? I mean, this is not, you know, this is, this is a churning process. Uh, these people can be tapped into, uh, can be brought into, can be productive contributors to a space CCC program. We have these infrastructure projects around the country that have to go, that have to be built. Young men and women can contribute in very significant ways. They can learn skills in the process. Take a, take a railroad, uh, building a high-speed rail in the United States, We'll take around 40 to 65,000 men or women uh, to build for every 5,000 miles of rail. 65, 40 to 65,000 at least, maybe more, but that's a conservative estimate. Um, uh, so, so think about that figure. Well, what goes into building a railroad? Well, you got to move supplies in. You got to build roads. You got to. You got to put up barracks. You got to put up warehousing. You got to move equipment. You got to have truck drivers. You got to have lots of things just to begin to begin to get the process going, right? Where people can begin learning skills, construction skills, and so forth. I'm just saying these are, you know, they're, yes, they're high tech uh, in many ways, but they're also they need people that are semi-skilled and unskilled who can come become skilled in these CCC programs. Um, uh, another picture of the uh, fab lab there at HCC. There's also one on the north side at HCC, another fab lab. There's also one uh, at Baker Ripley House Community Center out on the, on the west side of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Houston. Uh, also has a new fab lab. Um, so this is what you know, we have been organizing for. This was uh, from LaRouche's presidential campaign years ago. Uh, uh, this is exactly what we, we have to do. We've been on it. We can, uh, we've spread these ideas. Uh, we've now got to build it. Um, and uh, 
and we can do it in partnership with nations around the world. Um, so I think, let me stop there. There may be questions or discussion. I'm sure there's things I've missed. I'd like but, to say something. Oh, okay, well, just one, yeah. one thing finally, I'd say, looking at it today, we have uh, 30,000, 30 million youth in the country, young men and women, between the ages of 17 and roughly, I think the, the census figures go up uh, from 18 to 24. So it, it gives you a rough estimate, uh, 30 million plus. Uh, that the 2010 census I think was 30 almost 31 million so now we're probably up to 34 35 million something like that youth okay so so that's double what the population of youth was in in the 1930s and taking 1933 it was around 16 million uh, if we're going to have an equivalent size program today it would be a program that would employ at least double that is 600,000 uh, young men and women at any one time we would be we would be putting six million people through that program in the course of, uh, of say roughly the same nine years. Uh, you know, just using that since that was the period of the original CCC. So, uh, so if you add in women as well, which were not part of the original CCC, uh, uh, and it seems reasonable and, and and desirable that we would do that, then you're talking about, you know, a program of at least a million uh, in. Uh, in the civilian, a modern day civilian conservation corps, space CCC. Which you, if you then flip that over and say, okay, what's the demand? Well, first of all, the, the raw material is there. It's not only the unemployed, it's the underemployed. 33% at least, I mean, that was a Gallup poll figure. 33% of all young, uh, young people, young men and women are underemployed. They're working like flipping hamburgers and, and you know, waitressing and whatever when they, they could be doing far more in terms of their capabilities. Um, so all of this is, uh, so the underemployed as well as the unemployed, this is an enormous pool. And then are there the projects? Damn right there are. They're out there and we gotta build them, right? So we gotta have LaRouche's four laws as Keisha indicated. We gotta have Glass-Steagall, we gotta have a national bank, we gotta have national credit. And what we've got coming online now, a crash program for Moon and Mars, which was the fourth law of Lynn, driven by fusion energy development. We're not going to get to the moon without 1G acceleration. We're not going to go to the Mars, if I said the moon, I misspoke, Mars, without being able to get there within a few days. Two days minimum or maximum, two is the, as the shortest period we could do it in, four days, five days uh, maximum, depending on the location of the Earth relative to Mars. Um, 1G acceleration is the physical circumstances in which we can do it. You know, uh, Jason Ross raised the fact, well, maybe we can do it at, you know, half of Earth's gravity instead of 1G. Well, that's also a possibility. The point is, we got to go there. We got to do this. But we have, we have the initiative now on Moon Mars, at least in outline, mm -hmm. the beginning of that, uh, with what Trump has announced and what NASA has adopted as a program. We got to, we got to expand that outward. Uh, and in the, in the course of this coming uh, few months, we've got to mobilize to our chapters, uh, our committees of correspondence, and our campus organizing, um, the uh, political wherewithal of the country to make this the policy of the country uh, uh, through our federal government. So let me stop there and teach you. You wanted to. First, I had a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, which is interesting because we've been talking about this movie, um, when we when we were Apollo, yeah, it's a documentary movie. that came when, out. When we were Apollo. We were Repeating Apollo. that for the yeah. audience, you definitely <laughs> want to get this movie. It's available uh, on Amazon.com for about a buck or something. And they were talking about during Apollo to accomplish the goals of the Apollo mission laid out by Kennedy. Uh, you had like over 400,000 workers trained in various skills and so forth, um, and that project then was a certain spin-off really from what had been set into motion by um, by the CCC camps. But I, I, I was thinking about that as you're talking about this because when you say CCC camps in the 1930s, the objective of what they were doing then, working in forestry and so forth, we're almost talking about, I mean correct me if I'm wrong, a combination, not yes. that they're going to be like the people today are just going to be working in forestry and so forth, but just in terms of the advancement of the skills, 
but then also the advancement of the skills that were required in the education under the Apollo program uh, and the spin-offs that that created were far more advanced than what the first original CCC. Absolutely. So Absolutely. that's that's yeah, we're, what we're, about. Uh, yeah, I didn't I, I didn't emphasize it so much in the presentation I just made. Um, so I'm glad you brought brought you, you brought up what you brought up. Um, we're really talking about at least a two-tier program. I mean, you can call it two elements. You can call one space CC and one space tech. But uh, you know, uh, I, I like to think about it as all under the you know the umbrella of space CC. Mm. You know, on the one hand, we're going to take people that have been kicked to the side of the road. You know, that that are down and out. You know, in the uh, in the so-called ghettos. Uh, similarly, the, the impoverished and rural areas of the United States, which is a huge growing problem. You know, the opioid epidemic reflects this. Um, uh, but there, you know, you're talking about, you know, you're talking about uh, something like a million youth at least. Um, uh, and, and so they're going to be coming in into, this, into a civilian conservation corps type program as a space CC program. And that, but that also, like you're indicating, it's going to have to involve a lot more education this time than last time. Right. You know, um, uh, just working on projects. Well, first of all, yeah, in the 1930s, the idea was they would the, the CCC camp and rollies, that's what they were called, would only do simple work. That was the term. Roosevelt agreed to that term, so that they were not competing with labor unions. With or with you know with currently employed. In other words, they weren't being used for union busting, right? So so the idea is, oh no no, they won't do that. They won't compete. They're going to be doing conservation work. So it was non. It wasn't competing with existing labor. That's how it got kind of shaped. Okay. So now of course now as I hope I've, I've kind of at least indicated, we we need a much bigger workforce. Um, and that workforce has to become a lot more skilled. Um, and immediately, that workforce has got to be put to work on infrastructure. Because to build up the, uh, a modern infrastructure platform for the United States, a modern, going into building an interplanetary uh, uh, infrastructure platform for mankind, uh, we've got to have much higher uh, energy flux densities applied. We have to have uh, a much higher uh, increase or contribution to increasing the relative population potential density uh, of the nation and of mankind uh, in all the work we do. Um, and the technologies you know, that have been developed to date, thanks to the space program among other things, but also spinning out of you know, aerospace defense and so forth, uh, those technologies, uh, they're, they're, those, those technologies are, are in our hands or can be you know, can be brought into our hands. So if we take the initial building out of an infrastructure platform, young men and women in a, a uh, taken off the streets, so to speak, and out of the rural communities of the United States, can be trained up as workers, semi-skilled workers, relatively fast, between programs set up utilizing like the, the limbs, you know, the local experienced men, as they were called then, but now they could be people that were brought in from out of the ACC type programs. Right. They could be people brought in from uh, defense. We're going to have to retool defense. That's that's something that's going to absolutely occur. We're spending more on defense than the rest of the world combined, so-called defense. Um, uh, think of how, uh, you know, we have some of the highest technology machine tool capability in the country is in the defense sector. Uh, and skilled workers. What about utilizing those for the space program directly, right. right, for Artemis and beyond? But also, uh, you can think about that as a training capacity as well. Um, so that's one the one level. The second level, I'm, you know, I'm already pointing to, which is the young men and women coming out of call, coming out of high school with uh, degrees, high school degrees, GEDs. They're they're young. They're 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 not damaged in the way many of our youth have been. They've got problems, but they're not damaged in the same way as others. Those are the young men and women we've got to immediately bring in and utilizing something like national defense loans, uh, the program that came into being in the 1960s, 
but other programs that help finance um, these young men and women to take up these programs in STEM, you know, in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, including machinery, machine work, and so forth. Uh, so that's got to go on simultaneous. Mm -hmm. We now have, um, you know, to give you an idea, uh, uh, over 40% of young men and women graduating from high school graduate with a, a commitment to go into STEM programs in, in terms of their employment. But within a year, half of them have uh, changed their minds. Wow. Uh, and uh, and uh, even a smaller percentage graduate, whether it's two years later or four years later. So, so there's also a question of developing new pedagogies. You know, this is, is part of this you question of culture. To keep them in there. Yeah. yeah. You know, creating, it's also the, as you raise, as Helga was raising, this, the cultural issue. How do we actually um, uh, provide our young men and women with insights into true beauty uh, such that such beauty uh, causes them to, to uh, recognize in themselves and in others their creative capacities. You know, to, to, to then, um, uh, from that standpoint, uh, have a optimism about the world and about the people they're surrounded with and what they're capable of themselves. And so, in other words, you shift the focus from me and now to the future and what I can create and, and what others can create alongside me. Yes. So that's going to be a critical, critical component um, as we go forward because, I mean, it's not one dimensional. And I just wanted to add something okay. in the response to that because mm -hmm. I think that's important. Um, what we're getting in the organizing nationally and internationally is just the response to that idea that we're the only organization that's actually providing a future or access to a future. And we're doing this by one, we're out in the streets and we're organizing table deployments and we're in all different types of areas of the population presenting this program, this type of solution, which nobody else is presenting. And one of the places I was just getting some feedback today in mm -hmm. terms of what's going on nationally and the response we're getting. And one thing you can just say, it, see, is that this is beyond parties, absolutely. Uh, this is, as you were saying in your remarks, that you know people who were at both parties with this program that Roosevelt had set forth, nobody said, oh, that's a Roosevelt program. He's a, I mean, you might have had some crazy banker, Wall Street bankers who didn't want it to happen, but people knew this was going to be a return of something great for the whole nation. So that's what we're actually getting right now. And uh, what we're finding is that if, as we go into the Rust Belt areas of the country, as we go into what would be called blue collar democratic areas, you know, they're response is to exactly this program that, hey, despite our disagreements politically, maybe I agree with the president, maybe I disagree with the president, whatever, but we have to actually have a unified national mission. And look who's out here providing it. It's the International Work of the Schiller Institute, it's the LaRouche movement. And so it's interesting because the response that we've been getting to this program uh, well, I'll just say it like this. Think about it. If you gave this solution to young people, as we're doing on the campuses right now, both in the United States and internationally, and you say, would you rather be out with Greta Thunberg and the mask person and so forth in the forest trying to fight to survive, or would you rather be given access trying to, to the, fight the people trying to build something? Trying to fight the people, <laughs> trying to fight build. the people that are trying to build something or blow up the stuff they're trying to build. Right. Or would you actually rather be participating in the this productive type of future? And we have some. We're going onto the campuses. This is one thing we're doing to test this. What do people really want? Do they want access to this type of future? So in the next week, um, particularly on the tenth and the 12th uh, have been dedicated as 
yeah, I guess universal campus days where our organization is going to be going out to university campuses around the United States. Also, we have we're going to have participation in the Philippines and uh, South Africa, Africa, South Africa, Europe, Europe and Mexico, Mexico all of Europe. our America. And we have a number of campuses that are being set up. But we've already started this process, and the response is when we take signs out onto the campus and you know they have no limits to growth or the Green New Deal is genocide for Africa, and explaining what this whole anti-growth operation is, I mean, there's no question about it. There's, you, you think that the kids were, would be like, Oh, you know, population reduction, you know, pop overpopulation is real. We got to do something. CO2 is a big problem. These kids are not saying this. Actually, uh, last week when we were on the campus here in Texas, the response that we were getting was not, oh, you guys are, are crazy. We, we are spreading too, too much CO2. People were coming up because we had signs about, you know, uh, join the Artemis Moon Mars mission and people was like oh yeah I want to you know I want to do that I want to <laughs> participate in that so I just wanted to put that forward because this is not just like an abstract idea that we're talking about uh, it's the only thing that's happening in the nation right now that Thank you. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that people re actually recognize that and what we need to do is we need to have a national top-down mission and campaign where we make this the policy of the United States, as you know, is the point. Making this not just a few people know about it. The president needs to adopt this policy. The whole of Congress needs to adopt this policy. But we're not just going to cross our finger and hope that they're going to do it. You know, as we go to the campuses, we're getting young people. Um, one thing on this cultural question is that we're not just saying, "Oh, I, d I like these policies of economic progress." scientific progress, but we're saying, hey, participate with us in changing the culture. So we're taking some of these young people uh, and saying, join us in community choruses across the, or join us in readings of dialogues of great classical works, such as the Plato Dialogues, which is interesting is that we're getting people to join us uh, right off the campuses. So I just wanted to bring that up because that that's something that's really along with you know what we're doing across the board is so important because we're putting the responsibility the onus if if you will on the american people and we're starting this project or i want to say project but really what is going to define what happens is the idea of unleashing what we've called the committees of correspondence and these committees of correspondence are taking the responsibility of the individual citizen and saying you have to make this a reality make this happen and the way you do that is you got to go out there and spread it and organize people you have to demand it from your leaders from your congress members and so we're going to be doing more of that with our campus deployments and with our overall organizing uh, in the population. So we want to continue to have um, these types of discussions, small dialogue discussions all over the country. So I just want to bring that up because I think it's very important just that this thing is really taking, taking off right now in a big way and we're going to see more of this uh, as people are very much being given limited decisions as to what, what type of future they have any otherwise because Nobody else is providing such a such a vision, which is very important. Shall we close with that? With that? Okay. <laughs>